Um, Steve Martin, I'm going to give him the topic of maximizing outcomes with Achilles tendon repair. So we've all looked at the meta-analysis, uh, and they compare functional rehab to surgery. And if you ever don't want to operate on somebody, you can hang your hat on some of these studies. But the problem with all these meta-analysis is they concentrate on re-rupture rate and wound complications. And in the athlete, we concentrate on a little bit different. We look at the structural, mechanical, and functional quality of the healed tissue. And so we want to know how good is the healing. So I want to know tendon length and cross-section area. I want to know collagen 1 to collagen 3 ratio. I want to know muscle size of the gastroc and the soleus and plantar flexion strength. And so there's a couple studies in 2017 that came out that looked at this long-term morbidity of non-operative treatment, and they showed about a 15% difference in the size of the gastroc and the soleus. And as you would expect, a compensatory 5% increase in the FHL to make up for that weakness. And you're looking at about 20 millimeters, 2 centimeters of elongation of the tendon. Another study that came out in the uh, Journal of Experimental Orthopedics in 2017, cyclically loading the tendon, they compared four and six strand non-absorbable suture and then an eight strand absorbable suture, uh, and they all failed through the distal Kessler stitch. And if you think about it, it's your distal segment that's not moving. Proximal segment is gonna have some motion. Think of it like a rotator cuff repair. And so it's failing on that distal segment. And so what do we do for our younger, higher demand athletes? Uh, a technique that restores length without elongating, no eliminating wound complications. It allows early functional rehab and you get an improved muscle tendon complex. And so this is a, a study uh, that actually Andrew and Bob Anderson and their group out of Charlotte, uh, when he was there, looked at using the PARS, which is the percutaneous Achilles repair system. And in this study, they were using the PARS both in the proximal and the distal segment. So you still had a knot stack at the repair site. Uh, and they looked at 98% were returned to baseline at five months. Uh, I, you see the uh, circles there, the reoperation rate for a little suture irritation because of the knot stack but overall excellent results compared to the crack traditional uh, crack owl suture technique. And so this is a technique that I learned at this meeting, uh, and this is actually Gordon Mackay. Uh, you'll see him doing this in the lab, and it, this is a simplified form of it, so I'll show you the, how I do it a little bit different, but in the uh, speed and time uh, constraints that we have here. So leave the first needle in. Always have two needle points of fixation. So that leaves needle one in, put needle two in, and then pass your suture on needle one. And you always have two points of fixation. Then, needle, then the suture two is put in, suture three and four, and he simplifies it a little bit and just puts these in and doesn't lock the stitch. Uh, I lock the uh, third stitch and then pass a fourth stitch in there. But what I want to show you, it's not necessarily this technique. You can, you can do this even with a limited open technique if you don't like the percutaneous system. Um, but what I'm going to concentrate on is what we call the mid-substance speed bridge, which is basically an internal brace. And so after all these sutures are passed, you're going to pull them through. This is inside the tendon sheath. So all these sutures are passed inside the tendon sheath. And then you're going to do two percutaneous stab incisions on your calcaneus. We now use them a little bit more to the side and angle, a little more of a tent peg angle than you see in this video. And you're going to use a simple curved uh, lasso, and you're going to pass those sutures through the distal stump and that technique of making sure you're inside the uh, stump. And then you're going to attach it to two swivel locks. So once again, kind of conceptually think of it like a rotator cuff repair. And you're going to set your tension, you're going to set your length where you want to. And so you don't have a knot stack at the, uh, at the repair site, you don't have a volume of that knot there, and you're restoring length and you're attaching it to the calcaneus, so you're limiting that elongation you see with the distal sutures uh, with the crack owl technique. So it comes in a kit. Uh, even if you want to do it with a limited open, you're still saving that, that tenuous skin that doesn't tolerate the swelling uh, by leaving that bridge of skin there. So this was a case I did at 16 days. I had to mobilize this proximal segment. Then I did the mid-substance speed bridge. 
So your key points, technically, you want to make sure you set them very neutral prone. You don't want the leg to be laying too far one way or the other as you're passing your sutures. You split your peritinon transversely. You can do a longitudinal or a transverse skin incision, whichever you like, but split the peritinon transversely by two centimeters. Always keep two points of needle fixation. A little bit of suture management, not unlike a shoulder case. Uh, I use suture tape now instead of the uh, standard fiber wire. Uh, it's a little smoother as it passes through the lasso technique through the distal segment. On your distal calcaneus, you're going to have a tent peg angle and make sure that they're slightly divergent from the two. Always tap, cycle your construct, and then set your tension. And so uh, in an internal study with the Arthrex, they showed less gapping and a higher ultimate failure rate compared to standard crack out uh, tendon. And, and even conceptually, look at the picture on the left. And look at those crack out stitches and the elegance of the, of the technique on, on the left side, which is a mid-substance speed bridge. So here's one of our cases at Clemson University. This is one of our cheerleaders this last fall during football season. Uh, complete, uh, more of a little more proximal rupture, but a complete uh, Achilles tendon rupture. I prep out the other leg, so I set my tension equal to the uninjured leg as I'm putting in my swivel ox. You do want to cycle the construct. You can also uh, use the Achilles uh, angle there between the fibula and the uh, fifth metatarsal head. Wound healing, I do use jump start. Um, I, I like this in the, in the hind foot especially. Uh, I like the suture volume or the absence of suture volume at the repair site. There's less elongation. And the only thing, I'll, if you haven't done this technique, for about three months, sometimes up to four months, they'll get a little pain at the swivel lock site on the calcaneus. And that's my strain gauge that tells how fast I can progress my rehab. Think of it like a stress reaction because they're tugging. That proximal segment is tugging. And so if the athlete is going too fast, they get heel pain. You tell them, I've got to back you down just a little bit. By three to four months, it's generally gone. I do use uh, 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 ACP or PRP, uh, low, low white cell count. Uh, obviously, we can argue the studies. Um, basic science, I can show you a lot of studies, and I can show you a lot of positive studies on tendon healing in that environment. You've got a relative hypovascular area, and I want to augment that if I can. The problem with our human studies is they're all over the place. For every positive study, I've got two negative studies, but I've got too many variables. What's my platelet concentration? What's my leukocyte numbers? It's this balance of anabolic and catabolic mediators that we're not getting quite right. And then it's a dip, much different post-operative regimen study to study. So I like it in this situation, uh, that hypovascular Achilles tendon uh, area of healing. Uh, I also think it improves uh, a transition to collagen one much faster from collagen three. And then I want to do tension-specific mechanical loading so that I get the quality of the tendon that you saw in Tracy's uh, lecture uh, with that rat study previously. And we follow that by using pain, and pain is our guide. We use what the body's telling us. And so I use ultrasound to, to follow it. I like to see the size of the tendon. As collagen three goes to collagen one, the tendon will shrink in size and it becomes more linear. And so you know the quality of your healing. You can look at that clinically. You can see the pictures here. Her left side, is a, this is at four months. Uh, and you want it to normalize. We use this term in the ACL. I want to normalize that tendon prior to return to sport. And so our pro, my post alpha protocol, you can kind of go down the yellow ones, uh, splinted for two weeks, partial weight bearing to four weeks, full weight bearing at four weeks, dorsiflexion by, beyond neutral at six weeks. They're completely out of the boot somewhere between six to eight weeks. Uh, light eccentric at 12 weeks, on the ground at 16 weeks, and return to play generally at, at six months. Here you see their cheerleader at four weeks in the Alter-G, and you can see in the upper left, uh, some of us are lucky enough to have hydrotherapy rooms that look like this. So in summary, minimal dissection minimizes wound issues, maximizes biology. Maximal strength, and I want to minimize elongation, and it allows early weight bearing, which we also heard in the last study how valuable that is, and early range of motion. Thank you.